Excellencies, friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. With the first lecture of the new year, Dar al Athar Islamiya wishes you a happy and productive 2019. This opening of a new year is also the opening here at the Dar's auditorium of a new approach to the study of culture and development. How culture and cultural heritage make an impact on challenges to society as well as sustainable development. This is especially vital to Kuwait since we have experienced an internal, an intense and rapid series of events, technologies, and ideas that have impacted our heritage and its development, sustainable or not. Professor Marcus Helgert is the Secretary General and CEO of the Cultural Foundation of the German, German Federal Study States, a specialist in ancient Near Eastern studies he was previously professor for ancient Near Eastern studies as seriology at Heidelberg University from 2007 to 2014, when he became director of the ancient Near Eastern Museum at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Professor Helgert is the coordinator of the National Transdisciplinary Research Alliance, ELICID, focusing on illicit traffic with cultural property in Germany, funded by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. He was the founding director of the Heidelberg Center for Cultural Heritage at Heidelberg University and the Center for Digital Cultural Heritage and Museums at the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Professor Hel Helgert was the coordinator of the national program entitled Digital Strategies for the Museum of the Future. Under the auspices of the Federal Commission, or Commissioner rather, for Culture and Media. He is a member of several governing bodies and advisory boards, including the foundation board of the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas this is since 2017, 2017, and the Disaster Risk Management Committee of the International Council of Museums since 2017, and the German Lost Art Foundation since 2018. If I continue to list our speakers' many academics and professional achievements, there will be no time for his discussion. Suffice it simply to say that he, is, he has contributed much to the understanding and protection of cultural heritage and its relationship to culture. Professor Helgert, has received several awards for his academics achievements and holds honorary professionalships at the universities of Heidelberg, Marburg, and Berlin. Tonight, Professor Helgert will be speaking about the fascinating and important study in a lecture entitled, Why Culture Matters, the impact of culture and cultural heritage on social challenges, or societal challenges and sustainable development. Sustainable development is no joke, nor is the effect of the noisy interruption of your mobile phones or peeping during tonight's lecture. So be kind to turn your mobiles off and let's welcome Professor Marcus Hilger. Good evening, 
Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, Herr Botschafter, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. I'm honored by your presence and I would like to thank Her Highness Sheikha Hussa Al Sabah for her generous invitation to come to Kuwait. It's my first time in Kuwait and I'm amazed by the beauty of the city and the friendliness and hospitality of its citizens. Tonight, I want to talk about culture, but not culture as high culture, but how it contributes to our life, how it contributes to social cohesion and sustainable development. And obviously, I'll be doing this from a German perspective, or let's say from a European perspective. And I'd be very interested to see what you have to say on the matter. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion at the end of my presentation. I will try to make four arguments. I will be talking about four different topics. The first will be something that I call the cultural turn in politics. My second point will be research for culture and what it contributes to the impact of culture. I will also talk about current challenges to research for culture and then in the end talk about shared stakeholder responsibility. Let's start with what I term the cultural turn in politics. On April 18, 2018, Luca Yahir the new president of the European Economic and Social Committee, delivered his inaugural speech and presented his vision for a sustainable European future. Referring to the top priorities on his agenda for a sustainable Europe, Yahir announced his intention to strengthen the role of culture within the European political discourse. According to Yahir, and I quote, Culture has an enormous untapped potential to become a unifying and mobilizing force for Europe. In order to explain his reasons for this remarkable assessment, Yahir added, and I quote, we share a common European heritage, composed of shared history and values, which allows us to sense our belonging to a joint space in constant evolution and openness to diversity. Culture can help us overcome the current systemic, political, and identity crisis in Europe and dare us to dream to create new perspectives. It can play a crucial role in strengthening social and territorial cohesion, in creating growth and jobs, in engaging in dialogue, and in rebuilding trust. Culture can bring hope, new narratives, and a second renaissance to Europe." Unquote. What an amazing statement. Usually, when we think of culture and cultural heritage, the first things that come to mind are not sustainable development, social and territorial cohesion, or the creation of economic growth. Rather, we tend to associate culture primarily with high culture, that is, with the visual and performing arts, with literature and music, or with historical monuments and sites. Of course, these areas of cultural practice are eternal tokens of the endless creativity and unconditional freedom of the human mind. As original expressions of human dignity, they are ends in themselves and need to be promoted and protect it at all costs. However, in 1982, UNESCO coined a definition of culture in its Mexico City Declaration on Cultural Politics, understanding culture as the whole complex of distinctive spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features that characterize a society or a social group. It includes not only the arts and letters, but also modes of life, the fundamental rights of the human being, value systems, traditions, and beliefs, 
end quote. It is this more comprehensive concept of culture that has paved the way for a global phenomenon which I would like to call the cultural turn in politics. By that term, the cultural turn in politics, I refer to the fact that there is a growing awareness with various political and civil society stakeholder groups on national and international levels that the impact of cultural practice and cultural heritage reaches far beyond the realm of culture itself. In its 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, UNESCO emphasized that, and I quote, cultural diversity is a mainspring for sustainable development for communities, peoples, and nations, and that cultural diversity flourishing within a framework of democracy, tolerance, social justice, and mutual respect between peoples and cultures is indispensable for peace and security at the local national, and international levels." Unquote. Also in 2005, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, published a then groundbreaking analysis of the notion of culture applied to territorial and local development. Moving from the traditional notion of culture and expanding it to new dimensions, the study focuses on the different channels through which cultural products impact local development. Among its key findings is the observation that, and I quote, the substance of local development cannot be reduced to updating an export base. It also entails proper organizations of relations between players at the local level. Approaches in terms of projects, partnerships, quasi-contracts, social capital, and so forth show that local development depends on the capacity of local players to exchange and communicate using a shared system of values and norms. Culture can contribute to the constitution of this social capital. Culture therefore influences local development in three ways. One, by disseminating benchmarks conducive to synergy among players and project implementation. Two, by creating an environment that is attractive for residents as well as for visitors and tourists. And three, by providing leverage for the creation of products that combine aesthetic dimensions and utilitarian functionality. In a sense, it acts as an investment in social capital, an intermediate consumer good and a final consumer good." End quote. Recent impact studies confirm that investing in culture produces tangible benefits in the social, environmental, and economic sectors, thereby contributing significantly to the sustainable development and social cohesion of societies. Published in 2015, the final report of the European Union-funded project Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe concludes that safeguarding cultural heritage works as a multiplier through which investment can have positive impacts beyond that initially intended, thereby increasing the level of benefit and sustainability of the initial investment. Moreover, Potential future investment in cultural heritage from the mainstream policy stakeholders can be seen in terms of upstream investment, which has the potential to deliver significant downstream benefits. This can be seen in a comparison with often unplanned but beneficial impacts of upstream investment in preventive medicine, for example, healthier lifestyles, which reduce the downstream costs of treating illness and disease." End quote. The British Council's 2018 evaluation report entitled Cultural Heritage for Inclusive Growth adds an important aspect to this argument as it concludes that, and I quote, cultural heritage in its widest sense can be found to contribute to growth that is inclusive 
and sustainable if approached in a people-centered way. This approach can particularly benefit emerging economies which otherwise risk excluding individuals and communities from society and the economy. Through new and innovative ways of encouraging people to engage with, share and manage their cultural heritage, quality of life can be improved, value can be created for communities and economic growth can be more fairly distributed across society." End quote. Accordingly, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations aims at ensuring, and I quote, that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including, among others, through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of culture's contribution to sustainable development. In the very same spirit, the 2016 EU strategy for international cultural relations focuses on advancing cultural cooperation with partner countries across three main strands, supporting culture as an engine for sustainable social and economic development, promoting culture and intercultural dialogue for peaceful intercommunity relations, and reinforcing cooperation on cultural heritage." End quote. Last but not least, on 24 March 2017, culture and cultural heritage made it onto the stage of global security politics when the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 2 Three, four, seven, the first re resolution ever to focus exclusively on culture and cultural heritage, underlining that, and I quote, the unlawful destruction of cultural heritage and the looting and smuggling of cultural property in the event of armed conflicts, notably by terrorist groups, and the attempt to deny historical roots and cultural diversity in this context can fuel and exacerbate conflict and hamper post-conflict national reconciliation, thereby undermining the security, stability, governance, social, economic, and cultural development of affected states." End quote. Combining these notions, observations, and findings, it appears to be the case that culture does indeed matter and have a significant impact even beyond the realm of culture itself. There can be no doubt that what we have been witnessing in almost all areas of policy making is a cultural turn that acknowledges culture as a powerful agent of social change. However, what is less obvious is why culture matters and how its long-term effects on security social stability, governance, and economic development may be analyzed and measured. In fact, one might argue that we still know too little about the intrinsic nature of cultural practices and the various ways in which they impact social and political processes, and that, as a consequence, significantly more research is necessary, research on culture and research for culture. Let me briefly elaborate on this. Scholars, like myself, especially in the humanities and social sciences, are keenly aware of the fact that cultural practices, as well as their immaterial and material expressions, are invariably based on knowledge. Frequently, this knowledge directly derives from or is informed by research. For instance, think of cultural practices in literature or the performing arts. It is impossible to conceive of them as independent from research in various fields of science. At the same time, it is the immaterial and material expressions of cultural practice that may constitute additional evidence for existing research questions or trigger the formation of new academic fields. Ancient Near Eastern studies 
The area of my own academic expertise is a good example in this context. What we know today about the cultural practices and its material expressions in ancient Mesopotamian societies, and of course Kuwait is part of this historical continuum, what we know about ancient Mesopotamian societies we know by way of fundamental research in cuneiform studies and ancient Near Eastern archaeology. In turn, the knowledge generated through this basic research informs and enriches current cultural practices in universities, museums, and other cultural institutions. In other words, there is a mutually conditional relationship between research and culture. I tend to think that the close interdependence between culture on the one hand and research on the other is not acknowledged adequately in either sector, nor does it receive the political attention it deserves given the recent cultural turn in both domestic and foreign politics and policy making. This is all the more surprising, as there can be no doubt that research is ind indispensable not only for the creation, marketing and dissemination of numerous cultural products, but also for the documentation, analysis, preservation and protection of material and immaterial cultural heritage. By definition, this research for culture is cross-sectoral and encompasses such diverse topics as the historical background of a novel, the painting techniques of contemporary artists, the scientific analysis of archaeological objects, the documentation of choreographies, the management of cultural heritage sites, or disaster risk assessment. Pertinent research designs may be disciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary, depending on the research question. With an increased political appreciation of culture as a facilitator of sustainable development and peaceful relations, the demand for research for culture surges dramatically and acquires significant urgency. Additional knowledge is needed desperately, not only with regard to material and immaterial expressions of cultural practice and their individual specifics, but also with a view to the inclusion of culture in social, economic, and security policies, both on national and international levels. In addition, there can be no doubt that the effective transfer of culture into other core sectors of society and assessing the impact of this transfer through meaningful indicators will be among the key areas of research for culture in the near future. In other words, in order to understand cultural practices more accurately and to render them more effective in the context of social and political processes, we need innovative, cross-sectoral, fundamental research for culture. By doing so, we will pass from a mere perception of culture as a social agent to its purposeful use as an instrument for social and economic development. Impact of culture requires research for culture. I'm convinced that the cultural turn in politics and the research funding schemes likely to be inspired by it will offer tremendous opportunities for all institutions and academic disciplines ready to contribute to research for culture. However, it is also understood that fostering the multifaceted academic expertise necessary to carry out this cross-sectoral research is a highly complex task even for economically successful societies in peaceful times. In the following, I will outline four significant challenges for the progressive development of research for culture that I consider highly relevant for increasing the social impact of culture. Over the next decades, addressing these challenges proactively will be one of the key tasks for cultural institutions and researchers for culture alike. The first determining factor for the future of research for culture 
and the overall social impact of culture will be the way in which academic and cultural institutions are prepared to both embrace technological innovations in the information and communication sector and, more importantly, become active players in the overarching process which is commonly referred to as digital transformation, a process that will bring about major disruptions in the operation modes of most, if not all, areas of our everyday life. While at present the fourth industrial revolution, usually termed Industry 4.0, is gaining considerable momentum in many countries of the world, digital transformation projects such as Culture 4.0 and Research 4.0 are still in their early phases and not pursued with the same tenacity by their respective stakeholders. However, it is clear that within the next two decades, the ways in which we design, carry out, document, communicate, disseminate, and archive research and cultural activities will change dramatically due to the enhanced functionality and wider availability of artificial intelligence, big data, mobile devices, digital applications, cloud services, social media, and the so-called Internet of Everything. In cultural heritage studies, for example, research on objects will increasingly become non-invasive and mobile through online repositories of three-dimensional digital object models, while exchange and interaction between scholars and institutions will be strengthened through social media tools tailored to the specific requirements of editing and annotating digital object models. The more precise and metrically accurate these object models are, the more useful they will be for the preventive documentation, conservation, and restoration of monuments and museum collections. Moreover, augmented reality applications will revolutionize such diverse sectors as the management of collections and programs for inclusive education in museums. And what you see here is a collection of very simple 3D models that we did at the Center for Cultural Heritage in Museums at the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation that I founded in 2015. But as you can see, you can do a lot of interesting things with these models, including um, viewing a cuneiform tablet under different um, light angles, which is when you read cuneiform, you will know this extremely important to um, distinguish the signs. At the same time, the documentation and dissemination of immaterial heritage may benefit immensely from the opportunities provided by virtual reality applications. Moreover, highly detailed digital models of landscapes and settlements will be used for simulations of complex situations and processes, enhancing our understanding of environmental and cultural dynamics in societies past and present. Finally, Big data analysis of aerial and satellite imagery may contribute to a more efficient, permanent monitoring of archaeological sites and cultural monuments, thereby facilitating the implementation of preventive measures for their lasting protection against destruction and looting. And what you're seeing here does not have to do with destruction and looting, but is a 3D model of a cuneiform tablet that has one peculiar feature, and the feature is that it has been inscribed again and again, and there have been erasures and signs that were written on top of these erasures. When you look at the cuneiform tablets, it's in the collection of the Engineers Museum at the Pergamon Museum, you don't really recognize this. You only recognize it very clearly when you look at the 3D model and when you use some of the algorithms that have been used to make it more, um, well, telling of what actually happens in antiquity. If you use um, this image, for example, this algorithm, you'll see that there have been erasures and that um, somebody wrote on top of it. So this kind of technology may actually enhance research, develop new research questions, and help you answer um, others. And we'll stop this now. However, for the time being, research for culture 4.0 
remains an ambitious vision for the digital future, not only of societies in Europe. The implementation of this vision needs to be pursued with effective strategies addressing various challenges such as harmonizing, synthesizing, and rendering sustainable the numerous digital data repositories created since the late 1980s, integrating research data relevant for the cultural sector into national and international strategies for the creation of long-term digital data infrastructures, and establishing digital research and teaching methods as an integral part of pertinent university curricula, which is not something that you will find everywhere in Europe, for example. Finally, we will have to aim at diminishing the digital divide existing not only between states on a global level, but also between cultural institutions on a national level. Culture 4.0 and bridging the digital divide will also be crucial in the context of former colonial powers in Europe, in Europe establishing transparency as to the holdings and acquisition history of their non-European collections. Exhaustive digital inventories of these collections will be an important prerequisite for decolonizing ways of thinking, modes of behavior, and international relations. However, the benefits of the digital transformation of research and culture can only take effect when access to the pertinent expertise, technologies, and infrastructures is as widespread and equally distributed as possible on a global scale. The second type of challenge research for culture is facing today is one that may have the most profound impact on its credibility and thereby on its social relevance. It is certainly a type of challenge that at present is felt by many to be the most palpable and the most pressing one. In essence, being a societal challenge, it is reflected in the question how cultural and research institutions, as well as the academic community as a whole, react to the massive humanitarian and cultural crises in several regions of the world, and what role they choose to play in emergency response and post-conflict rehabilitation programs. In my opinion, experts in research for culture have a pronounced twofold responsibility to get actively involved in measures focusing on cultural heritage preservation and protection. One, the destruction and looting of archaeological sites, museums, archives, and libraries immediately affects the core of countless academic disciplines as it damages, diminishes, and displaces their very research subjects. And two, protecting the material and immaterial heritage of humanity and creating environments in which this heritage can benefit local communities and foster a cultural diversity cannot be achieved without the knowledge and experience of scholars, as argued earlier. As crucial as it is to create the policy frameworks in which cultural heritage protection can thrive, it is the scholars who are indispensable in national and international efforts to assess existing damages, carry out conservation and restoration measures, curb illicit trafficking in cultural property, build civil society capacity for the sustainable conservation and preservation of monuments and sites, develop international standards of engagement and raise public awareness of the inherent value and social relevance of cultural heritage. However, scholars with expertise pertinent to research for culture are not necessarily specialists for fighting organized crime or for staging awareness-raising campaigns. Moreover, given the already sparse human and infrastructural capacities typical of many relevant disciplines and institutions, how can they provide the additional capacities that are required to design, assist, and or carry out corresponding programs. I strongly believe that these considerable obstacles must not dishearten us, but should be seen and treated as a unique opportunity for research for culture and the pertinent academic disciplines to expand their topical and methodological scope 
and to increase their social relevance and public visibility. This unique opportunity derives from the fact that protecting cultural heritage in situations of conflict and building capacities for a sustainable preservation of cultural heritage in times of peace are tasks for which many academic fields, not only in the humanities, possess a considerable inherent potential for the transfer into society of their research results and expertise. By doing so, the pertinent disciplines follow the distinct call by society and politics for an innovative kind of research that addresses overall society, societal challenges and therefore possesses a specific transformative power, a call that at least in Europe has been growing louder, growing louder and more vigorous over the past decades in all areas of science and research. Yet, especially within the humanities, there is an ongoing heated debate whether this call for research activities oriented towards societal issues and favoring the transfer and application of research results is justified and in line with the treasured principle of freedom of research. My own thinking on this is very clear. As the global challenges to the sustainable development of humanity become more evident. As many regions of the world face the consequences of climate change, social inequality and violent extremism without adequate mitigation or protection mechanisms, publicly funded research must not close its eyes against these challenges, but attempt to develop ethical frameworks and research strategies enabling them to address these challenges, not as a substitute for, but in addition to the basic research they have been carrying out traditionally. Considering the sustained large-scale threat to the integrity of the world's cultural heritage, the academic community is called upon to team up with non-academic experts and various stakeholder groups in order to design and carry out transdisciplinary research projects aimed at strategies policies and instruments for the sustainable conservation and preservation of cultural heritage. In this context, I consider the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage in Conflict Areas, Aleph, a most promising initiative for an innovative public-private partnership aiming at the sustainable protection of cultural heritage. Established in 2017 at the initiative of France and the United Arab Emirates, and immediately joined by private partners as well as other states such as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, Aleph has the potential to set new standards in the area of research-driven transdisciplinary action for culture. The third type of challenge that research for culture is up against in most European countries is of a structural nature. It concerns the actual ratio between the tasks to be fulfilled by the pertinent academic disciplines in the areas of research, teaching and transfer on the one hand, and the personal, financial and infrastructural resources that can be, can be committed to these tasks by their professional exponents on the other hand. Frequently, Research for culture is carried out by so-called rare disciplines or small disciplines, which means that the available resources are usually sparse, if not precarious, and that the concerned disciplines and the bodies of knowledge contained therein are prone to extinction or serious incapacitation when individual teaching positions or facilities disappear. In addition, we can often observe distinct asymmetries on a global level in the availability and number of individuals and public institutions dedicated to research and teaching in these small academic fields. Think of my own field, serology or Byzantine studies or Egyptology or papyrology. Many more examples could be quoted in this context. It has always been a considerable challenge to drum up political support for academic fields that have virtually no potential to thrive outside of universities and other research institutions. Given the high numbers of students and the relatively low number of teachers, 
in many of the more sought-after disciplines with a broader array of post-degree career opportunities, it does take very good arguments to convince the president of a university to invest in a field where the average class does not have more than 10 participants. In several countries, including Germany, this has led to intensified efforts to develop political concepts for monitoring and promoting rare and precarious disciplines on a national level. However, so far there is no reasonable answer to the crucial question what the minimal infrastructural requirements might be to keep a rare or small academic disciplines operational and innovative. In addition, existing global asymmetries within many precarious disciplines have not led to any palpable response on an international level. And this brings us directly to the fourth and last challenge to research for culture that I would like to address here. Increased political and financial support for research for culture and the cultural sector as a whole might be much easier to obtain if the impact of culture on the well-being, social cohesion and sustainable development of communities could be measured accurately and spelled out in numbers. Even though, as demonstrated earlier, there is now a broad consensus that culture is a relevant factor in social, economic, security and climate policies as well as in corresponding measures on national and international levels, quantifying this factor is largely still impossible. This lack of quantitative data attesting to the material equivalent of culture in other areas of social practice is a challenge to research for culture that is both a methodological and an existential one. It is a methodological challenge in the sense that adequate methods for a precise assessment or even measurement of the impact of culture still have to be developed and tested. At the same time, I call this challenge an existential one because without such methods and reliable impact indicators, the recent cultural turn in politics will most likely not lead to the required political and financial investments in the further development of cultural institutions and research for culture. The cultural turn in politics would thus remain a mere claim and an unfulfilled promise for the cultural sector. One important area of research for culture relevant in this context is the creation or stimulation of impact. This impact planning process has to precede the actual impact analysis. Here the key question is what kinds of strategies actors in the cultural sector should pursue in order to maximize the impact of their engagement. Generally speaking, there is a three-tier approach to planning impact. One, identify needs and challenges. Two, define impact goals, and three, develop an impact logic by aligning individual project goals with the project design. In other words, before going on a boat trip, you need to understand why you want to make that trip, where you're going, and which boat will get you there, on which route. Against this strategic backdrop, fundamental research for culture is necessary in order to adapt this overarching approach to specific scenarios within cultural pro projects and to refine the individual steps of the planning process accordingly. At the same time, transdisciplinary research is just as crucial when it comes to the analysis of impact in the cultural sector. Here the approach consists of four individual steps. One, prepare for the impact analysis. Two, develop indicators. Three, gather data. And four, evaluate and analyze data. Methodologically speaking, this area of research for culture is the most challenging one, as developing indicators and gathering meaningful data for the impact of cultural engagement is an extremely complex endeavor. Post-project evaluation, primarily focusing on the target groups of projects in the realm of culture and foreign cultural politics is carried out, for example, 
by the Goethe Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. Evaluation methods employed successfully by the Goethe Institute are invariably qualitative and include the actor network theory, world cafes, social network analysis, situation analysis, and mental maps. In addition, a much more systemic, systematic approach, UNESCO published a Culture for Development Indicators Methodology Manual in 2014. The study introduces a comprehensive set of 22 quantitative and qualitative indicators grouped under seven dimensions, which set out to illuminate the role of culture in development, particularly in low to middle income countries. These culture for development indicators aim to provide an evidence-based and informed approach to the introduction of culture into national and international development strategies, as well as to cultural policy formulation. In spite of these and many other attempts to develop indicators and measures for the impact of cultural activities and financial investments in culture, detailing accurately and in hard numbers what and how culture does in fact contribute to peace, social cohesion and economic development is a goal still to be reached. This holds true even for highly successful cultural development programs such as the European Capital of Culture competition established in 1985, following an initiative by Melina Mercuri and Jacques Lang. Commissioned by the European Parliament's Committee on Culture and Education, an evaluation report on the success strategies and long-term effects of the European Capital of Culture program concludes, and I quote, impacts upon the host city's existing cultural system and future plans for cultural activity are the most prolific areas of reported beneficial impact from European capitals of culture. Benefits include projects that continue beyond the hosting year, increased collaboration and networking between cultural providers, and increased capacity and ambition within the sector. However, there is a significant absence of real evidence relating to the social impact of European capital of cultures, probably due in part to the relatively diverse nature of work that is targeted towards social impacts and the relative cost of undertaking significant field work to explore such a field of activity." Unquote. To put it in a nutshell, let me repeat what I said earlier. There is no doubt today that culture does matter significantly beyond the realm of culture. However, why it matters, how it matters, and what methods might yield reliable impact indicators remain questions still to be answered by research for culture. As a conclusion, I would like to summarize my line of argumentation and propose three recommendations designed to promote research for culture and thereby strengthen the impact of culture. I have tried to demonstrate that over the last four decades there has been a massive reappraisal and revaluation of culture in the social and political spheres, which I have termed the cultural turn in politics. This cultural turn in politics is reflected in the claim that cultural practices and the cultural objects have a palpable impact outside the cultural sector and that investing in culture produces tangible benefits in the social, environmental, and economic sectors, thereby contributing significantly to the sustainable development and social cohesion of society. In a second step, I have argued that the mutually conditional relationship between culture on the one hand and knowledge and research on the other has been traditionally underestimated and that innovative cross-sectoral research for culture is indispensable if we want to pass from a mere perception of culture as a social agent to its purposeful use as an instrument for social and economic change. Impact of culture requires research for culture. In the third and last step of my argument, I have identified four current challenges to research for culture 
that I consider relevant for increasing the social impact of culture. One, the digital transformation of our societies. Two, the massive threat to cultural diversity and cultural heritage posed by conflicts and crisis. Three, the precarious state of many academic fields relevant for research for culture. And most importantly, four, the methodological difficulties in establishing indicators and processes for an accurate assessment or measurement of the social and economic impact of cultural activities. If we agree that culture is the fabric of social cohesion and the rhythm of sustainable development, it must be the task of all pertinent stakeholders to acknowledge these considerable challenges and to deal with them in a constructive manner. Specific responses need to be given by both the academic community and by those who create and implement the policies governing research and culture. However, let us make no mistake. The more resilient research for culture turns out to be in the face of these challenges, and the more successful its exponents are in embracing rapidly advancing technologies, social political transformation processes, and not least the need to demonstrate impact, the stronger will be the political determination to sustain and promote the pertinent academic disciplines and the entire cultural sector in the future. Without knowledge, there is no culture, and without culture, there is no society. Therefore, if we want to strengthen the appreciation and impact of culture beyond the realm of culture, we need to do three things. One, raise public and broader political awareness of the power of culture as a catalyst for peaceful international relations, social cohesion and sustainable development. Two, expand the expertise, infrastructures and capacities of cultural and research institutions to acknowledge and integrate these additional dimensions of cultural activities. Three, promote finance and carry out the cross-sectoral and transdisciplinary research necessary to create the required knowledge base. Committing substantial human and material resources to the implementation of these measures would by no means be a luxury, but an indispensable investment in the future of our planet. Thank you for your attention.